So without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Cliff Hudson to the stage. Cliff Hudson is chairman and CEO of Sonic Corporation. He joins us on set and he's brought burgers. Burgers and, by the way, this is a pickle juice slushy. Is that right? That's correct. Is it sour? Uh, it's, it's sweet and sour. Sweet go, and ahead and go ahead and try it. I think you'll be surprised at it. Well, you know what? It's so thick that you can't it's stuck in the get straw. it through the show. Is it good? That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it actually is good. Yeah. It's there like it goes, drinking yeah. an ice pickle. Okay. But sweetened. A little sweetened, but not hey, really sweetened. Yeah. Keep your eye on them and you'll, uh, you'll <laughs> okay. see here. Um, same store sales. You see what's happening yeah. to the stock this yeah. morning. What, the economy's going gangbusters, isn't it? We yeah. got tax cuts, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. I'm surprised to see a decline in same store sales. They were yeah. small, but it was a decline. What happened? Well, uh, so uh, at, uh, for the system, a 20 basis point decline. For our company stores, a 20 basis point increase. The fact is, as the quarter went along, in the month of May, we had a 2.5% positive. Earlier in the quarter, the primary thing that was causing some bumpiness was uh, weather, and as we got beyond the weather, then sales were consistently positive. So as we told the market yesterday during our release, May was 2.5% positive. Into June, we see no deterioration from that. So now that we've got beyond some of that, uh, that cold weather, late cold weather in the spring, uh, we've really seen much more consistent positive, and I think we're on a very good track. And the forward. stock had rallied pretty tremendously. Well, and this is part of it. When you talk about the stock being down after close yesterday, the stock had had about a 40% run up in the last month. So there was there was probably an opportunity for a little profit taking and, and maybe a little error. Which okay. Good morning. So I did bring a PowerPoint presentation. So you know, uh, uh, that's that's how I uh, how I sonic, you might say. That was a fun um, video. Summer of uh, 2018. Uh, six months later, Inspire Brands bought the company, and uh, they bought it on a Friday, and I moved out on a Saturday. So my uh, my life's been different since then. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today to talk about that uh, time leading Sonic and. Uh, um, uh, you could say managing, but I think in a franchise organization in particular, leadership is better terminology, is appropriate for the circumstance. Um, and uh, talk about some of the experiences I had. Uh, it's interesting to me, uh, all of you all are uh, leaders in one form or another, uh, by title or by fact or both. Uh, it's interesting to me the public uh, uh, polling always shows that public speaking is one of the biggest fears that people have. And uh, so I think uh, each of you as leaders of your organizations got to find your place to get over that, that fear to the extent it is one. Um, I recall years ago in getting ready for a presentation, um, a fellow officer of mine, I think he was trying to be positive, but he got a little off base in saying to me, he liked some of my stories. He said, you're really good at self-defecation. He said, and there was a pause and I said, tell me you meant self-deprecation, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, you know, mean what you say, say what you mean, critical part of uh, public speaking. But uh, the role, it's uh, fun to be with you today because I spent uh, my whole career in the franchising business and small business and franchising make up such a huge portion of our economy. And it's not just the economy, but the job creation that uh, you're all involved in so critical for uh, our uh, economy, so critical for our country, community by community. Now, uh, my career was with one company, Sonic. I was there for 35 years. I had a progression um, in, a, in position over time. Uh, they, I started out in my 20s as uh, general counsel of the company and uh, did that for about eight years. I was CFO for a year. I was uh, chief operating officer, I think, for a year and a half, maybe going on two years, and then I was CEO for 23 years. So uh, the company changed a little bit over that time uh, that I was with the company. In that uh, 35 years, I was part of the management team that bought it in 1986. Uh, we paid 10 million bucks for the company, and uh, none of us had any money. It was a leveraged buyout. Uh, and uh, um, uh, but it was the best investment I ever made. 
uh, part of the group that paid 10 million bucks in 1986, and of course then CEO for 23 years when we sold it to Inspire Brands for 2.3 billion. So a rather radical uh, transition in value over that time. The system-wide sales, 95% franchise, the system-wide sales uh, when we bought the company were 300 million. When we sold it, the system-wide sales were 4.5 billion. So managing those relationships, yes, but providing leadership for the system, really a very critical part of, uh, of my time with Sonic and the story I'd like to share with you today. Um, I have a little book. Uh, the subtitle really is the key piece here, often the case, How a Jack of All Trades Can Still Reach the Top. Um, looks like this. I've got about 50 copies of it up front. Uh, so 50 of you, uh, actually 49, I took one off the table, but uh, 49 of you are, will, are uh, welcome to come up and uh, grab a copy of it, um, and, uh, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. I'll give you some examples of some of the leadership concepts that I think were critical in terms of uh, the success of Sonic over a lot of years, and some uh, elements of that leadership that are I think pretty straightforward. Um, I don't think the concepts will surprise you. I'll give you some examples of uh, how they came to life in my circumstance and what a huge difference they made. So first is this concept of leadership. Um, it is easy to think that, uh, uh, I thought it was interesting a moment ago uh, with the point being made, uh, for most important thing, people, second uh, most important thing, culture, and I would agree with that <laughs> like a million percent, you know? You, uh, you may have heard the phrase before, um, that culture eats strategy for lunch. And uh, in fact, it does. You hear people talk about strategy, and strategy is important. But culture is going to carry you through all kinds of things over the years. And uh, I think that uh, this is one of the things that we focused on heavily with our franchisees was culture um, and a, a healthy, communicative culture, collaborative culture. And so what was my path that I was, uh, um, you might say, kind of intuitively willing to go that direction? Because it's not intuitive for everybody. And there are some folks who uh, may have a hard time uh, being collaborative and, and uh, have a little bit more of an old style uh, commanding approach to dealing with the franchise system. Well, I'd have to say that my first leadership position uh, was when I was president of my boys' glee club in junior high school. And uh, if, you, if you ever have the responsibility for standing before about 40, 12, 13, 14-year-old boys uh, who are ugly and smelly and so on, and your objective is to get them to warm up together and then sing four-part harmonies, and you pull it off, uh, that's, a, that's leadership, believe it or not. And uh, a year of being engaged in that way, I actually came out with a bit of a, a change self-concept. And then, and I think similarly, moving on into high school, president of my student body, et cetera. This gave me a different kind of feel of how to lead groups than I think I would have had had I done it in, uh, if I were talking to you today about sports analogies or large corporate uh, analogies or military analogies, et cetera. Um, so in coming through those experiences in life, and applying them in that circumstance, what are some things that, uh, from my standpoint, I can say I felt like I picked up effectively? Um, one, listening skills. Now, I think listening is about the uh, most underrated skill uh, that we can uh, develop. And why do I say that? Uh, the point made earlier about forming a franchise advisory co council that Shannon made the point and listening to them, don't just form it and have it as a as a uh, just check the box thing. Uh, but rather, you know, franchisees are going to be very creative in the way they go about their business, and they will come to you with great ideas. You've got to figure out which ones can be scaled and which ones can't be. But my, one of my best examples, I think, and best just because the impact it had on the business, was uh, when I was chief operating officer of Sonic, uh, a franchisee came to me and said, I need your help. And so, OK, well, how do you need my help? I need your help because your guys are out here in the Carolinas messing with me, telling me I have to stop this program I have got underway out here. Now at this point in time, the lion's share of, this is 1995, and the lion's share of Sonic's business was lunch and dinner, sandwiches, drinks, tater tots. And uh, uh, when I say the lion's share, probably 80, 
85% of our business came at those day parts, lunch and dinner. The request that he had was, he had developed in the Carolinas an ice cream program. And at that time, I would guess that ice cream was probably 3% of our sales. And uh, he said, your, your marketing officers, your franchise relation officers are telling me to shut my program down. I mean, quite literally, he said, they tell me that's Dairy Queen, it's not Sonic, stop doing it. So I thought, well, need to learn a little bit more here. And so I asked him uh, perhaps an obvious question. Um, what, what does your store with the highest percentage sales of ice cream, what percentage of sales does that store do in ice cream? His answer, 30%. Well, I about fell off my chair. Here we were doing 3% as a system, and this guy's got one third of his bucks coming in, in in ice cream sales. So my comment to him was, please don't stop doing this. Let us send some other folks out and let us understand what you're doing. And, and about a year later, a little bit more than that, we did roll out across the system a new ice cream program. We, call it, we called it, and it still is, Fountain and Frozen Favorites. And uh, uh, my CFO at the time liked to say, just give me a promotion that, where you mix things with air or water. I just love it, you know? And uh, so that's what Fra Fountain of Frozen Favorites was all about. The year after we implemented that program system-wide, store-level profits, I'm not talking about top line, I'm talking about bottom line, store-level profits went up 40% in one year uh, across, at that time, about 1,500 stores. So the impact of this was extraordinary. Um, impact on our business was extraordinary. It, 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 it changed everything. Probably not a surprise to you because it was sustaining. This wasn't a one-year deal. We grew it and grew it. My suspicion is the year he said, leave me alone, we probably did about 25 million in ice cream sales. My suspicion is the Sonic System now, I've been going almost five years, Sonic System probably does about 500 million in, in ice cream sales now. So it was transformational for the business. It paid for new stores, it paid for retrofits, it paid for new marketing. Uh, the consequence on the business over the next several years, that was 95 when he said, leave me alone. It was 96 when we rolled it out. Uh, in 97, the system hit a billion in sales. Four years later, it hit two billion. So uh, from 97 to 01, it went from one billion to two billion. So a large part of that was fed, you might say, by ice cream and the profitability from ice cream and drinks. Extraordinary impact over a relatively short period of time. So one, Listen, that's uh, uh, easily said, and it, it does uh, require a little bit more of a collaborative heart, I think, in the first place. But these ideas are going to come to you left and right. And your job as a leader is to try to discern which ones have application on a systemic basis. And you can develop for your brand and roll out and have that kind of impact. The second thought for you is co-opt other people's ideas. Now, I don't mean copy their business concept, that's not the point, but the fact is the, the marketplace of ideas is the public domain. And when you, if you have your eyes open and, and your head up, you're gonna come across ideas that can be implemented in your business. It may be something somebody else is already doing, but you can do it differently and you can do it better in your business or it'll have a bigger impact in your business than you've seen elsewhere. I came across this one time in the, uh, about five years, as a matter of fact, after we had rolled out the ice cream program. I was at a conference for, a very small conference, um, eight or 10 CEOs, and uh, Nation's Restaurant News had sponsored it, I think, or at least they had held, the, brought the group together. And uh, uh, so we had eight or ten uh, restaurant CEOs, mostly QSR. I don't think there was any fine dining there. And um, it was sponsored by Visa. And uh, a woman from Visa got her kind of commercial time about midday. It was a, a single day event, but she got her commercial time. And she told us several things, quite interesting. Not surprising to you, particularly now in 2023, but in 2000, 2001, this was a little bit more news. One, she said, you know, who makes the buying decision in the family? Mom. What's one of the biggest things that's going to affect where mom wants to go when she leaves work or it's late in the day? Answer, a place that accepts credit cards. 
her comment was, you accept credit cards more than twice, the, the mom is more than twice as likely to come to your shop. Um, so I went away from that. Uh, it was interesting to hear that. And I was looking at thinking 95% of our sales at that time, 95% of our sales were cash. So why didn't we do more in credit cards? We accepted them. And of course, the answer was that the customer had to turn over their credit card to a car hop, let them walk in with it. Now your credit card's gone for three, four, five minutes anyway. Um, 20 years ago, probably some discomfort with that. Uh, I think today, a whole lot of discomfort <laughs> with turning use your credit card in that manner. And so what was the answer to that? Well, the answer was to bring the credit card reader to the customer, which today is easier still with technology. But what we did, what we experimented with and then rolled out system-wide, was attaching a credit card reader to the parking stall, to the menu housing. Fairly simple little piece. Did we come up with that idea? Well, heavens no. I mean, every service station in every community had a credit card reader attached to a dispenser. And so in essence, really what we were doing was kind of copying what we had seen elsewhere. But two things happened with that. One, no surprise to you, when people can use credit cards, they spend more money. And we found our average check when people would use a credit card was 40% higher, from five bucks to seven bucks, when people would use a credit card. So enormous convenience and big shock to sales. Now, we finished rolling that out, the credit card readers attached to the menu housing. We called it, a uh, funny little name, Pays, Pay at Your Stall. We finished uh, rolling out Pays in 2003. I mentioned a few moments ago that in 01, thereabouts, we had hit $2 billion in system-wide sales. In 2018, when the company was sold, we were at $4.5 billion in sales. That incremental $2.5 billion in that 15-year period was 100% credit card sales. So in terms of impact on the business, that's not a new product. It's not necessarily a new service. What it really is is convenience to the customer. And from my standpoint, yeah, it was an innovation. But from my standpoint, I took what the Visa woman had told us, and I took my own experience using credit card readers when every time I had to fill up my car, and simply applied it to our circumstance, believing that this could be better than the experience people would have with many of our competitors at that time, 20 years ago. And it had a huge positive impact. So in a lot of ways, when I say co-opt others' ideas, they don't have to be all your ideas. You can't possibly come up with all the ideas. But that doesn't mean you can't take advantage of them, apply them to your business in a very successful way. So that kind of leads to a third element that I think is a critical part of a healthy, growing business and something that consumers expect, and that is innovation. And that can take all kinds of forms. I think I've just described two of them. One of them is uh, the idea of the product piece, uh, innovation through new products. In our case, drinks and ice cream, we already had it. We just packaged it in a program and been promoting it, and it was enormously profitable for us. Another way to innovate is through technology. We're all experiencing that. I mentioned this circumstance involving what we call pays, pay at your stall. Huge impact on the business, very positive. And, uh, um, and uh, ironically, in the, in the retro, retrospect, uh, it was interesting at the time when we started doing that, we had operators who would say, well, how about if I just put the credit card reader at every other stall? You know, that would be cheaper, you know. But anyway, it was an interesting way to think about reducing the cost of the capital impl implementation. But how does the customer know, you know, you got to pull into a cash stall or a credit stall, you know. But regardless, we didn't go that route, and the impact was very positive on the business. Now, one of the things we re launched into um, a number of years ago at Sonic, and when the company sold, we had implemented the technology for this, but didn't get to see the full benefit of it until really years after we'd sold the company, had to do with uh, the general topic of thinking about your brand in the 21st century, excuse me, in a 20th century context and a 21st century context. How do you think about it in the bricks and mortar age, and how do you think about it in a digital internet age? I've come to think about this under the heading 
of bricks and clicks. And uh, later this fall, my former chief information officer and I, Craig Miller, pictured here with me, uh, will have a new podcast we are initiating on just this topic called Bricks and Clicks. Craig and I worked together for just sort of 10 years at Sonic and worked on something we came to call integrated customer engagement. And really what that was, I made the comment a few minutes ago about looking for ways that you can utilize things that other people develop, but you may be able to use it better in your brand than they can use it in theirs. And I came to that view in terms of the use of a mobile app and the thought about that. I suspect many of you have been to a Sonic drive-in. If you haven't, it's basically like a 1,500 square foot uh, kitchen on a parking pad, generally with about 25 stalls. You see it pictured here. And um, so what was the difference that struck me we could utilize here? First of all, they're all kind of touch points. We all have them. We have them in our business. We have them in our lives. Digital touch points with consumers. But the thing that struck me here was Sonic, rather than having a single point of contact when the customer came on lot, a drive through window, or come inside and stand behind a counter, single point of contact when you uh, interact at the, with the cashier, Sonic had 25 points of contact. And we had an opportunity to utilize the technology differently with a consumer and change the experience from a convenience standpoint in a way that would grow our business, I thought and felt, quite handsomely. Let's take a look at this video. We'll talk about it. This is an extension of the, of the, uh, the CNBC program you saw a few minutes ago. But she's asking in this, in this video about, uh, about, uh, a, about a mobile app. And uh, so a discussion about mobile app, uh, mobile order, mobile pay. Uh, but the whole concept of this integrated customer engagement goes well beyond that, and I'll talk about that in a moment. This is the summer of 2018. Ours is around 180. The decimal point's <laughs> at a different place. So. Right. Uh, you're rolling out mobile ordering, right? We are. How hard is that? Uh, well, the difficulty is mostly, I think, behind us, in fact, uh, because the, uh, it, the difficulty is about all of the technology we've put in place, the whole platform, the network we've built over the last several years, requires a new point of sale system at the store, requires a, a customer interface in the stall, requires the customer to have a, a smartphone, but that's in place. So now what we're doing is updating the app market by market. It's now in, about, it's in stores representing about 29% of our sales and it makes it easier. Your, your guess that you had on just a moment ago, it was on the screen, was talking about convenience being such a major factor. Uh, this, this in the QSR business is going to blow away convenience. And the reason it is, the, the customer can choose where to order, they can choose where they want to pick it up, they can set the time they want to pick it up, all on the app, and then pull into the stall, connect with the stall on their app, and literally be first in line, have their food in two minutes that they've totally customized. So I think it's gonna change convenience for our industry. And the good thing about it, because we have 25 parking stalls, we're the only one that can do this in the QSR business. That's what QSR said, stands though, you, for quick serve restaurants. You yep. had to do this on a customized basis though. You couldn't, you couldn't outsource That is correct. Did you outsource this to somebody else? Uh, we tried that and then we built it ourselves. That's so in spite of the lack of connecting up the lip with the audio there, that interview really did happen. So, uh, but you get the gist of that there. Uh, it wasn't, I mean, you can say, okay, everybody's got an app. You can say everybody wants to uh, get the business in that way. The difference for us was a pretty fundamental one in terms of the experience from my standpoint, in terms of uh, this idea of integrating all of the touch points uh, we'll be, I'll be talking about this this fall and next spring uh, with Craig on the podcast with the intention then of, uh, of, a, of a book that will walk through the years we spent building this and this thinking about 20th and 21st century brand building. But as it related to this integrated customer engagement, it really was intended to be a process of moving these touch points that we had that were in different uh, st settings, different uses of different technology, integrating them and moving it to a one-on-one -on -one marketing engine, but also moving it to a point that when the customer came on lot, we were able to connect with them in a way, um, in a way that would really yield the most personalized service experience in the country. Because the customer that orders off lot and pays off lot and pulls onto a Sonic drive-in lot, 
then enters the stall number and we now rather suddenly have information about that person who's in the stall, their history of ordering, what they may have ordered before and they didn't order this time, etc. with the idea of marketing to them either on their smartphone or in the video that they're literally looking into as they pull into the as they pull into the stall. The objective here very much was to be able to look to the right medium that the customer is using and have the right message at the right point in time so that we could move away from uh, what we had been tied to more historically, uh, uh, national television or national cable, and engage with the customer in a point where it made sense to them and personalize messages uh, based on their, uh, their personal preferences and their operating history with us. But the very fact that we had the 25 parking stalls made all the difference in the world because, why? What I like to say, when the customer came in and put the parking stall number into the app, we ordinarily tried to get the, the order out to the customer in four minutes from the time of order. What we experienced in 2018 once we got this rolled out, customers that would order off premises and pay off premises, pull into the stall, enter the stall number on their app, Got their, got their order delivered in a minute and 50 seconds. So it more than cut it in half. So you think about in any restaurant business, the idea of turning your tables, uh, but also in the QSR business, what's one of the biggest complaints? One of the biggest complaints, you screwed up my order. You gave me somebody else's order. You didn't give me a full order. You got my order wrong, et cetera. The likelihood of screwing up that order when the customer has entered it digitally is greatly reduced, and we were experiencing that at the time. When you think about our competition and their points of entering there being either a drive through window or walk in and going up to a counter, what you're talking about is a sequencing that has nothing to do with when their order came in. And uh, this is a continuous, going to be a continuous challenge, I think, for the QSR business and drive through windows. How do you match up orders to people that are in a drive through window? There, uh, many of our uh, competitors are exploring how to do that. Sonic, the good thing was Sonic was really built for it. I had the opportunity to speak to Harvard Business School one time on what does the business case look like once you, we got the integrated customer engagement place, how do we, what would the building look like? And I said the building will look like this. Popped up, boom, it was the same old building. That was the great thing about it. It was as though the technology was built and made for us. And the impact on the business was significant and uh, my suspicion over time, the fact is I told you by the end of, uh, by the end of uh, 2018, uh, the uh, Inspire Brands had bought the company. So those of us who had worked on this really didn't get the opportunity to see uh, what occurred over time. I think the opportunity to go beyond, uh, I, we do get informal feedback, the highest sales from mobile order to mobile pay at a given store right now is about 45%. Average for the system is about 25% of sales. So uh, very meaningful impact on the business, smoother for the operator, uh, more gratifying for the customer that's less likely to have a messed up order. But the, uh, um, the opportunity, it seems to me, is still there to integrate this, whether Inspire Brands will go that direction uh, is their call over time. But the opportunity, I think, in terms of personal engagement with the consumer is a very real, very real opportunity. So my thoughts for you, as I kind of walk back through that, um, one of the most underappreciated under -appreciated lessons, uh, just listening and soak it out. Uh, you know, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, uh, cheap endeavor, you know? But the opportunity, even in terms of picking up new ideas, listening to vendors, listening to your partners, and most of all, of course, listening to your customers. The opportunity to learn from them and apply it in your business is a pretty complete opportunity. Co-opting others' ideas, there's nothing wrong with that. It strikes me that the marketplace of ideas uh, is in the public domain, and you can't think of everything. And when you put the pressure on yourself to be the one that comes up with all the ideas, one, you put unnecessary pressure on yourself, two, you limit the opp opportunities for your business. Co-opting ideas, and then thirdly, innovate. I think that innovation um, is an absolute necessity. Your, cons your customers are looking for it. Uh, your partners are looking for it. 
the dynamics of a business, a business that's going through innovation is always a healthier business and a more interesting atmosphere and for, uh, for all your associates. But at the same time, in terms of your brand, I think the, the necessity in that innovation is do it as you are prepared to do it, but be bold in the process because um, your customers will be looking to that, your customers will respond to that, and it is a critical part of that innovative success, in my view. So my feedback for each of you, it's a pleasure to be with you here today, but it's also a pleasure to see how many people are involved in uh, small business so actively. You really are the backbone of the Amer American economy and the foundation for our future. Uh, I appreciate what you do through your businesses across the country, but a community at a time, so thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. And I think we've got a couple of minutes for Q&A if, uh, if anybody has any, uh, any questions. Yes, sir. So the question was, could I talk about some difficult stories with franchisees and how we navigated them? Um, we never had any difficulties, you know? <laughs> I'm glad you laughed. That'd be uh, painful if you didn't laugh at that. Um, you know, um, uh, first let me tell you, we did have a Franchise Advisor Council. We didn't do anything. No technology, no new products, nothing about the building, nothing about uniforms without taking it through the FAC. And so uh, this meant, of course, over time, that uh, as we would move to the point of implementation on an initiative, it was already sold into the system because we had a pretty large franchise advisory council that represented a good part of the system. So um, I think that probably alleviated a lot of um, difficulties for a long period of time for, uh, on a sustained basis. The number one thing that alleviates difficulty is uh, growing profits. That, that keeps a lot of peace in the family. So um, I guess I'd have to say the... Uh, a couple of things come to mind. One, one is neither an ordinary course of business, but uh, um, you know, one of the things that was transformative into a business, and it took us uh, between a year and a year and a half to do it, back in the, just as I was moving the CEO job, was a license renewal process. But I think the, the thing I could say to you there was it was open, there were franchisees very involved in the negotiation of the new license agreement, and when the rollout occurred, in spite of all the grumbling, it was widely uh, utilized. So I think it does go back to that openness, transparency, engagement, collaboration in the process. Um, a more, a more, uh, one that was more elective, but I thought critical for the business. In 2012, we went through a negotiation process because most of the marketing dollars were spent in local marketing cooperatives. And the world had changed enough with national cable, and in my view, when I was thinking about things like this integrated customer engagement, I saw media changing dramatically over time. And my desire was to move the dollars to a national pool. So that was a very difficult and, and contentious negotiation. But the process we utilize, very open, you know, first of all, under our license agreement, we could, ch we could change the requirement if two, if two thirds of the store is approved the transition, so it really was kind of a selling process. But, it, the, but the advice I'm trying to weave into that is the openness, the transparency, the engagement, showing operators why it's in their best interest to do so. And what we showed operators was that if we could move those dollars on an act to a national basis, that the minimum increase in gross rating points that a television market, individual tele market, television market would get for no new dollars, the least would be a 20% increase in gross rating points, and, and the high end, some markets got like a 60% increase 
in gross rating points. There were no new dollars. It was a very contentious process because people really liked having those dollars local. It was a, almost a lifestyle thing, not just a business issue. So uh, that was a contentious one, but it was approved uh, ultimately by about 93% of the operators and has been in place now for 10 years and was transformative for the business. It really is what really made Sonic more of a national brand and aided our franchising dramatically. Our headquarters is Oklahoma City, but took us to more to the East Coast and the West Coast and so on and so forth. Transformative for the business. But I think that openness and the collaboration is a critical part of the ongoing relationship if it's going to be successful. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so uh, the simple question was, um, uh, we were an early adopter of some of these other technologies. What technology am I excited about um, that uh, I would be interested in today? Yeah, I don't know that I really have an answer for that. Uh, I mean, the, the, the technology, you know, we all know, the pace at which it changes is quite extraordinary. And uh, the opportunity for all of us two and three years from now versus where we are today uh, may well not be recognizable you know, today. So I, I don't know that I have a specific um, uh, thought uh, the, the folks that are in the room have such varied businesses and circumstance. Uh, I do know that uh, innovation, I think, is key. And uh, you get stale and the customer's going to see it and they're going to know it. And uh, that technology, of course, is one of the key elements uh, of that. So I'm not, I don't have anything more specific for you than that. And if I did, I probably wouldn't tell you anyway. So, <laughs> Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. So the, uh, the question was, uh, the, the books uh, ran out quickly. Where, where, do they, where can you get a copy of the book? Uh, you can go to cliffordhudson.com and order it there, but you can also go to the Harper Collins website. That's a publisher. You can get it there. You can also go to Amazon where you get everything else in the world anyway, so, and you get it there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the question was, yeah, I don't have a big innovation department and I have a big innovation budget. So how do I innovate? And uh, uh, my reaction to that is, uh, well, there was a time where we didn't either. And the, f the first example I gave you of quote innovation, uh, in our case, when we rolled out frozen fountain favorites, you want to know how many of the stores had a soft serve ice cream machine inside the store? 100%. Yeah. We just weren't packaging it and promoting it, you know. But this one franchisee, he was, because he was off by himself, and he was innovative in order to keep himself alive. So it strikes me that uh, you may not have a budget, but uh, there can be fairly simplistic ways in terms of how you, en how you engage the customer, where you engage the customer, uh, things you know, things that can be true and integrate with your brand logically, where it's a, it's a real fit from the consumer standpoint. In other words, don't try to bolt something on that doesn't make sense for your brand just because it's an innovation. You want to improve the customer experience, improve your product, and, and, what, and what that largely may be is just improving the convenience, you know, for your customer. But uh, the other place to look, depending on the size of your business, you may not have a big budget, is to look at vendors because your vendors may have much bigger budget and they want to see you do what? Drive their product. And so, um, you know, when we, when we wanted to put those pop screens up, we called it that point of personal service, the, the video screen in the parking stall. First thing I pushback I got from operators was, we don't want to pay for that. And I said, well, don't worry about it, you know, because we put advertising on there. 
and our vendors paid for 100% of those screens across the entire system. And it just, the complaints, you know, from a franchisee standpoint. But I viewed it as critical because it was our point to have uh, con interactive connection with the customer when they pulled in and at first just literally being able to get the, the uh, stall number onto their smartphone, but then more importantly to begin marketing to them while they were sitting there waiting for their food, uh, which was the objective over time. So that would be my pitch to you. There's natural innovation that can occur if you keep your head up, keep your eyes open, different ways to look at your business, but then if you don't have the budget, vendors are a logical one to turn to. So can I call for a great round of applause for yeah, 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 yeah. Yet. Okay. We are so fortunate to have the ability to co-brand with people of Cliff's Caliber. It's amazing. The, um, we hope you appreciate the content and the programming. You know, he'll be sticking around for the whole time. And so you can come back and ask him whatever you like. Um, and I'm sure we can arrange to get some more books if you let our folks know. Uh, Dad said he will personally buy everyone a book. No. Um, but we do want to, we want to take this opportunity to uh, induct formally Cliff into our springboard Hall of Fame as our 2023 inductee. So can I please get a round of applause for our new Hall of Fame member. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah.